Okay. So I gotta work on my posture. You got yeah. good posture. Do you want to cushion? No. Oh yeah. Is that gonna help me? Yeah. You're gonna save my life today. <laughs> oh my god. Because my like natural is like this. Same. So anyway. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> Tell me about your childhood. <laughs> I actually saw a video of myself in Boston last week and I was like, I need to start doing these shoulder exercises. Isn't that disturbing? Because you I think know. you look all great and I then know. you see the video and you're yeah. like, hello, yeah. Tara here, hello. Yeah. No, why? <laughs> That's your like TED talk. You're like, today we will. <laughs> no. And also seeing yourself from like behind. Oh I'm my like, God. Does my bottom seriously look like that? Seriously. <laughs> Because I think we're not meant to see ourselves so much in yeah. this age of social media and like, well, even just seeing yourself on camera, it's like, we're supposed to be looking that way. Yeah. I feel like it's, it's causing so many mental health issues because mm. you're looking at your, but why you're not supposed to see your back. I know. You're not supposed to see it. <laughs> I know. And it's, it's interesting. It'd be interesting to like, see how your journey's gone with that. Because for me, mm -hmm. I've got a friend who's a nutritionist and she said, you know, we were trained for clinical practice and now we've got to be like an actress as well. But wow. you actually were an actress and now you're, you know, doing the more social media things. So it's just interesting for all of us are kind of going like this. Totally. So I guess for me, it's like sort of more natural to be on camera, whereas like you trained as a doctor. Oh, by the way, hi, welcome to the podcast, guys. I'm here with uh, Tara Swart. I was going to say Tara but it's Tara. It is. It, but it is. It, it is. <laughs> but I don't mind if you forget during Tara. the course of the conversation. Tara sounds much nicer. <laughs> Tara. Yeah. I, I say Tara. <laughs> Tara, what's going on? When I moved here, I had like the thickest Chicago accent. Did, I was like, is oh that my, where you're from? Yeah. Oh, nice. It's like, oh my God, I'm in Hollywood. It's obnoxious. <laughs> the O's are as, <laughs> and the A's are as, so it's Tara. <laughs> Tara. <laughs> it's terrible. Tara. Tara Swart, neuroscientist and best-selling author of the book, The Source, which I'm like deep into and loving it. Thank you. What is The Source? It's basically your brain firing on all cylinders. Whoa. And interestingly, the strap line in the UK is open your mind, change your life. And here, I'm guessing the one that you, you've got is the secrets of the universe, the science of the brain. Whoa, yeah. So, you know, oh. both of those kind of explain where I was going with that, which is that if you really understand how your brain works and how to get the best out of it, then you can live your best life. Wow. This is exciting. I can't wait to dive into that. What we were saying is social media and how are you navigating? So how are you navigating going from what neuroscientist and psychiatrist mm. to... So as a neuroscientist, you have to do a lot of public speaking. Okay. So that I had done from quite a young age. D you don't do it so much as a doctor, but you're kind of more one-to-one -one with people. Yeah. So I'm definitely, my forte is one-to-one -one rather than like groups. Okay. Um, and then I changed career about 15 years ago and I was doing one-to-one -one coaching. Mm. Then neuroscience became this like buzz topic in business and leadership. So I had to start speaking again. And I remember just thinking, well, I... I I used to do it a lot before and I became quite good at it when I practice, so I'll be fine. So that's already a way of priming your brain, isn't it? To not fear public speaking, which a lot of people do. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then, you know, social media, well, you know, the iPhones came out around that time. Yeah. Um, and then social media grew, you know, first it was Twitter, which isn't so visual, obviously. Yeah. Um, I think these things just change like a little bit at a time and you kind of get used to it. And mm. I don't know if you know this, but I actually wanted to be an actress when I was a kid. No, I didn't know that. Yeah, so I think there is part of that kind of, that, you know, frustrated actress or that kind of don't really mind showing off a little bit kind of thing that probably helps. Totally. Yeah. Because actually the reason I wanted to come onto your podcast is that I still think that maybe not so much now, but f until really recently, it's kind of not that socially acceptable for women to be funny. You know, women wow. are supposed to be pretty. That's and right. so, and it's kind of like very cool for men to be funny, but some people like don't know how to handle a really funny woman. Oh yeah. So like, I really wanted to support and you know, we've got a friend in common who's also a very funny woman. And yeah. I actually think I'm really funny, but people <laughs> don't. Think. I think I'm hilarious. <laughs> Nobody else does, but I do. And I stand by that. 
people yeah. that know me do. No, I'm sure. <laughs> For people I'm that sure. don't, I don't think they like think that I would be. No, I think you are. I mean, I watched a podcast you did with I cannot remember his name, but he's also British. Mm-hmm. Thirty something. That's not narrowing it down that much. <laughs> you know, <laughs> British guy. Yeah. The British guy. He's got a podcast. <laughs> It'll come to me, but you were funny on there. Like oh, I was laughing thanks. I mean, you're good. funny. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. That's really interesting. So, um, yeah. Why is that? Why aren't women, why isn't it so accepted still? I think, you know, there are some traits that are considered to be masculine or feminine maybe. Yes. And it's been like that for a long time. And I mean, I remember the guy I wrote my first book with an attitude for acting. He was the, foundation course director at RADA in London. Okay. And he said, my daughter's actually really funny and it just makes me kind of like worry about whether she's gonna be accepted. Wow. I know, this was a while ago now. Um, but because to be funny, you've actually got to be super smart. Oh, I love to hear that. <laughs> you know, this podcast is called Idiot. I know. <laughs> Tell me more about that. Well, I mean, it's, be, it's quick witted, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> Stop. Stop. Are you hitting on me? <laughs> um, but yeah, no, please keep going. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's so funny. Um, yeah, so like, not, not like telling a joke, but being yeah. like Im improvising and being funny like in the moment. Yeah. You've got to be thinking ahead to do oh, yeah. that. So yeah, no, it yeah it's, sense de to me. it's definitely a, t a type of intelligence, mm. right? Having a sense of humor and like mm. understanding. Mm why something is funny and just, and you have to be somewhat observant too. Hmm. I also think it's, cause people are like, did you study? And I was like, no, I feel like I was just wired this way. Really? That's interesting. I was going to ask you about that. Yes. Like it wasn't, I, I didn't go and take a course. It was like, I feel like I, I always say I had a funny bone. Yeah. Now it could be a little bit of nurture too. Like mm -hmm. my dad, I like to describe my dad as like Kramer from Seinfeld, but drunk and not racist. That's my dad. <laughs> like it's very like specific, but, but he's just like six foot four and lanky. And like, he would just walk in a room and you just laugh, right? He's just physically really funny and his faces are big. He's not necessarily intentionally funny, but okay. he just has that like funny bone words. And then my mom is a storyteller and she, mm. and so I just listened to stories and stories and stories and she always knew how to tell them and tell them in a funny way. Mm -hmm. So I feel like that combo gave me the like physicality and then the storytelling. So I think probably, but then my sisters had that too. Mm. And they're not, you know, one's a math teacher and one <laughs> lives on a farm and grows her own potatoes and you know. <laughs> So I don't know, is it nature or nurture, I guess? Well, I mean, it's always a bit of both. And I think for, for the longest time, like almost including when I was at medical school, we thought that D DNA and genes like had the biggest effect on everything. But now that we know about the field of research called epigenetics, mm. which is the environmental factors that switch on or off the expression of certain genes. Whoa. So with your, you know, the three sisters that you're mentioning, you all probably have a similar ability to be funny, yeah. but for various reasons, which could include things like birth order or you know, certain circumstances during at certain ages, yeah. yours got switched on a lot. And um, you know, I mean, I'm sure they're funny too, but they've obviously got strengths in other areas, right? Definitely. And I guess they all have a sense of humor, hmm. definitely. So, but I'm the baby, so uh, maybe that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. The class clown, I guess. Yeah. And for you, so I was reading in your book about how, yeah, you grew up in London, right? Mm -hmm. but you felt a little bit like an outsider, right? Well, I felt like I had to kind of have two lives. Yeah. So I had the life at home where, you know, there was yoga and meditation and Indian food, for Sounds example. Sounds fucking amazing. I know, now I'm like, really, <laughs> lo like, love it, yeah. <laughs> um, and then, you know, I went to school, I just wanted to fit in with my friends. I just yeah. wanted to, like, have stuff in common with them and not be that different, you know? So I just learned from a young age to keep those two things separate. Like you didn't tell your friends how like turmeric was a super power. <laughs> cause, cause you wrote about that. Like that was like the take turmeric for everything and it'll solve all problems. I know. Type thing. And like, you know, but does it a little bit? But now, now it's been proven that it does. <laughs> I right. I know. Your parents were onto something. Exactly. Um, 
And actually, one of the things I've become really interested in is like ancient wisdom that we've forgotten and how mm. we can bring that, you know, back into our lives and our practice to help with modern mental health issues. Wow. But I just want to go back to this humour thing because I'm a bit older than you. So it's definitely in my generation, it being funny wasn't really a feminine trait. And so a lot of people will push their sense of humour into their shadow. So wow. your shadow psychologically is the part of you that you don't want to see. And the reason is that you depend on your primary caregivers, usually your parents, for survival from being a baby to a young child. And if there's anything about you that they don't like, then subconsciously you think, well, if I do that thing, they won't love me and then they won't look after me and then I won't be able to survive. So you hide it away. So a lot of my things were stop showing off, don't be so bossy, don't talk so much. Um, wow. And... So I wouldn't particularly say sense of humor is in my shadow, but I think for a lot of women it is. Well, here's the wild thing that's super interesting. My dad was not happy with my decision to be in comedy. Uh, he, right. So growing up, my mom, she was always laughing and supporting, whatever. But my dad would often say to me, be beautiful. You're beautiful, really? Laura. He goes, do drama. He goes, what are you doing in comedy? Stop distorting your face like that. Wow. <laughs> like, stop it. Yeah. He cringed every time I would make a funny face and do a funny voice and try and make wow. my family laugh. Mm -hmm. He didn't like it. How you know? Yeah. And so when you said the thing about the shadow, what, mm -hmm. what do you call that? It's just... Yeah, the, sh the shadow part of your personality the is where you hide away the things that your primary caregivers don't... Have. Yes. Yeah. So I... I Ironically enough, like, yes, I do that for a living now. And it was always a passion. I always knew like it was the thing I was best at. So I was going to find a way to do it and make mm -hmm. money doing it. Cause mm -hmm. it was what, where, where I feel the most alive and what I feel mm -hmm. I'm the best at. And so, but I did wrestle with that for years, wow. certainly with men, I would find, especially in my romantic life, yeah. I would hide that part of myself. Mm -hmm. I remember my ex he found, we first started dating and I was funny, subtly funny, but yeah. I certainly wasn't my full funny self. I yeah. did that because, right, be yeah. feminine, be yeah. pretty, wear the skirt, yeah. you know, let them be funny. Mm. And my dad enforced that idea yeah. that it was not appealing. Mm. And, you know, so I felt shame around that. Mm. And then I remember my ex Steven found a YouTube video of a compilation of characters I had done. And this was before I had a social media presence. It was mm. some like audition I did for SNL or something like that. And it was on there and I was mortified that he found it. Like I remember crying and just wow. so mortified because I was like, this is it. It's over. It might put him off. Absolutely. I'm done for. You should have seen these characters. I was like, I'm done. There's no way he's going to want to sleep with me anymore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, like mm -hmm. this is what... And it turned out to be like the thing he loved the most. Aww. Like he was, he, that's like one of the reasons he fell in love with me yeah. because I made him laugh and I yeah. was funny. Mm. And I was like, oh, okay. So I think that sort of um, lessened the shadow, you know? And I, I also think when you're in that first flush of love, when you found like the person, yeah. you also feel like you become so much funnier as well. Like obviously mm. you think they're like just so funny. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Every yeah. word that comes out of their mouth. <laughs> But I feel, I, I sort of remember thinking, I feel like I'm so much funnier too now. Mm, yes. And it is, it's oxytocin flowing around. Wow. So that's the bonding hormone. You would have experienced that when you gave birth, when you breastfed, when you first hold your baby. Um, but it's also part of falling in love, social bonding, and even like team bonding at work and stuff. And so that makes you feel all warm and fuzzy. And there are several ways that you can kind of induce that in yourself or with someone else. So physical affection is the main one. So like, hugging, kissing, sex, sex, massage. If you're lonely, then having a bath instead of a shower makes you feel like enveloped in that way. Ooh, mm. so having a bath gives you more oxytocin than a shower? Because mm -hmm. you're immersing yourself in warm water, so it's kind of like a hug. It's like a water hug. Yeah, it's a water hug. It's a water um, hug. But also humor. So if you laugh by yourself, then your, your oxytocin levels go up. But if you laugh with someone, it actually bonds you through the increase in oxytocin for both of you. Really? Mm. Whoa. Okay, so 
With oxytocin though, I remember a clip I saw of yours where you talked about how the woman releases oxytocin during sex, but the man releases testosterone. Is that right? Okay, so let's talk about that yeah. <laughs> for a minute. Yeah, yeah. So it's a bit more complex than that. I kind of try, I just try to make it super simple. But yeah. basically, when women have an orgasm, they always release oxytocin. So that would lead us to believe that, like, over repeated times, you're going to build up the oxytocin and feel bonded to that person. Even if the guy is full of red flags, the woman's like, He's the one. No, I like. I'm in love. Like, I need to have his well, baby. Well, because what what tends to happen is that, and you know, this is a big generalization, but <laughs> they say one thing and they behave in a different way. So even yeah. if they say, "Let's keep it casual. I'm not looking for a relationship." This is the woman, the man, the man. But if they're repeatedly having sex with you, then obviously there's a dissonance between what they're saying and what you feel that they're doing and then your oxytocin levels are getting higher and higher so you're becoming bonded yeah men do release oxytocin at orgasm too but it's quite blunted by their higher testosterone levels so they have seven to eight times as much um, testosterone as us okay also there's a hormone called vasopressin and all the research about this one it's it's actually um a lot of transmitters have dual roles or multiple roles so vasopressin is mostly known for your blood volume, your blood pressure, and like the salt balance in your blood. Okay. But it's also related to bonding and sex. So interestingly, if a man is interested in a woman and he's pursuing her, but they don't have sex yet, then his vasopressin levels and oxytocin levels will be going up and he'll be you know, starting to like, like her more. So the way to actually get like men to more likely to bond to not is to delay yeah exactly <laughs> but i mean what i hear these days with the dating apps is that like they're just ha it's happening on the first day it's blowing my mind i know because like i was married for 11 years i come out and it's like a whole new world with dating apps I'm like what is going on and i'm listening to my friends and they're telling me these stories about how they're sexting guys right away i'm like you <laughs> you don't even know him what are you doing I sending like naked pictures and then like honestly sleeping with people way way too early yeah. before you get to know them. and then they're left oftentimes heartbroken because they feel bonded and the guy's like on to the next because mm -hmm. he didn't release the base is it vasopressin oh yeah vasopressin and oxytocin yeah yeah yeah. So, so right. So you should hold women listen up, <laughs> but it's, it, that's so interesting. So how long would you wait? Would you recommend waiting before becoming into Well, I mean, I'm not really like on the dating <laughs> scene either. So uh, I don't want to speak for other people, but I yeah. think, you know, it's not so much to do with how many dates you've had or the amount of time, although people do they do put numbers to that, right? Like yeah. at least three to five dates first before even kissing. Or yeah, I mean, yeah. We're talking about so long ago since I was on the dating I scene. I still stand by it. Yeah. <laughs> and like, you know, like a few months to get to know the person. Yes. I mean, um, but it's more to do with understanding what their intention is, isn't it? Because if you are looking for something serious, then what you actually need to work out is, is this person also looking for something serious? Because if not, you're wasting mm. your time. Mm. And I think, you know, and I'm saying this about my own friends that I, you know, love and admire, the bound, you have to have good boundaries. You have to have a very good sense of self um, <sighs> in terms of just being, you know, careful with yourself, understanding that you're, you're worth being treated in a certain way yeah. and just not tolerating bad behavior. Yeah. Um, wow, that's really interesting. So how do you implement those boundaries or what, what would they look like? So boundary transgressions mm -hmm. usually happen either verbally, physically, sexually, or financially. Those are the kind of main ones, but okay. yeah, it can happen in any way. So it's basically the way that someone talks to you okay. or lack of communication is a potential red flag. Um, you know, how they... And, and of course, this is different for different women. So some women would love it if a man holds, holds the door open. Some women are not into that anymore, right? What so are you? What are you? Oh, I'm definitely like ultra feminine. Please hold the door open. Right. I love it. Yeah. I like that too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah. I'm just saying, I'm just acknowledging that a lot of women don't like that anymore. And that's fine too. Totally. But just, you know, to be aware of how is this person like around you physically? Yeah. Um, how, you know, how 
much do they care about your emotions and the impact that they might have on your emotions by some of the things that they say and do. And, you know, I mean, Tinder Swindler is a classic example of financial boundary transgression. But, right. yeah, I mean, this is true stories. Whoa. So. Got to be careful. Yeah. Interesting. So how did you, so in your mid thirties, you were a doctor, you were a psychiatrist for how long were you in that practice? Um, I was in that practice for seven years. And then what? Um, well, when you first um, qualify or graduate, you have to do six months of medicine and six months of surgery in the UK. So I did that, but I knew I wanted to specialize in psychiatry. Okay. So and why? I, um, so I had started medical school and then gone off to do my PhD in neuroscience, thinking I was going to become a neurologist. Wow. But when I came back to the clinical school, we do the actual practical stuff. I was just fascinated by how your own brain can play tricks on you and you can hear voices that aren't actually there and your mood can change like out of your control. And I thought that was more fascinating. It was more people centered than, you know, looking at brain tumors and abscesses and strokes and things like that. that so it sounds kind boring. Of um, <laughs> just <laughs> yeah, that's not, yeah. <laughs> It's not. I think, you know, I've, <laughs> with, with the specialties in medicine, you very quickly start to tick off things you know you don't want to do. Right. But then, you know, to narrow it down to one quite early on in, in your career and at, at a young age is quite difficult because it's got consequences for the rest of your life. But I, mm. I, liked the, I wanted the people interaction and that totally makes sense to me looking back that that's what I would like and be good at. Okay. Um, and I tried all the different like subspecialties of psychiatry, child psychiatry, um, you know, vulnerable females, criminal psychiatry, old age. And I also traveled the world with it. So wow. my first husband and I worked in Australia and Bermuda. Um, I did some work experience in South Africa when he was still there. And I think I just, it took me that time to realize this isn't stimulating me intellectually enough. And that's why I'm always yeah. looking for like, something different, somewhere different. Um, and at that stage, I thought the world of psychiatry isn't gonna change that much in the next 30 or 40 years. I turned out to be wrong, because psychedelics are like a very interesting area of research now. Ooh, how do you feel health. about those? Um, so in a regulated environment with a qualified practitioner, the research is looking really exciting in terms of just one or two doses, um, several months apart having really lasting benefits for things like depression and schizophrenia oh wow i'm concerned about the lack of regulation yeah. in general in terms of people you know using it either themselves or with somebody that's not you know sort of fully professionally qualified yeah 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 um, but the research is looking very interesting and I'm also just obsessed with mushrooms in general. <laughs> You're just like, I eat them every day. I'm <laughs> tripping my balls off right now. <laughs> <laughs> right, okay. Um, did you know that if you put your mushrooms on the windowsill, they actually synthesize vitamin D from sunlight? Really? Yeah. What mushrooms are we talking about here? Like, <laughs> <laughs> here we're talking about shiitake. Oh, and right, okay, okay, mushrooms. got it, got it, got, yeah. it, got it, okay. Why? What? Where, no, where did I just, go? I didn't know. I didn't know because we were just talking about psychedelics. I didn't know yeah. we were talking about. I know. I just, I, I, I tricked you by saying I'm also obsessed with mushrooms. Yes, yes, it? yes, yeah. yes. But also like the mushroom powders that you can add to your tea and coffee and stuff like that. So does that make a difference? If yeah, I mean, so there's all sorts of different ones that, so eating them <laughs> is the, like, <laughs> the ones that I just mentioned. But the powders, you can get lion's mane which is like particularly can help induce neuroplasticity which is to help your brain to grow and change oh i want life. to talk about neuroplasticity yeah. next but yeah and then tremella is one that holds more water than hyaluronic acid so it's really like good for your skin so, so do like you eat them every day or take the powder i add the powder to my like matcha really mm. okay and you do you actually feel a difference so that is a very difficult question for me to answer and i want to just put that into context because I eat super, super healthily and I have been doing that for a long time. So if I take like, I used to be the chief neuroscience officer for this brain um, multivitamin supplement. I don't notice that much of a difference because I already eat so well and I, you know, I, I'm a good sleeper and I drink yeah. lots of water. But the feedback that we would get from the customers of mm -hmm. that supplement was like massive changes in terms of insomnia, anxiety, 
um, you know, gut issues related to intuition, brain fog, that yeah. kind of thing. So, you know, the, the potential change kind of depends where you're at. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. I'm definitely an advocate of like, eat right first. There's no supplement or, sh you know, shake that should be replacing good food. What is eating right? Dark skinned vegetables. <laughs> Are you a neuroscientist? I am. Are you yes, coming on to me now? Yes, I, yes, <laughs> I am. <laughs> I love um, dark skinned vegetables. Okay, yeah. But anyway. So, yes, dark skinned um, vegetables. Well, a, third, a variety of 30 plant based products per week. And that can include spices and like things like, you know, black pepper, coffee, tea as well. Ooh. Dark chocolate too. So like um, 30 coffees a week, 30, <laughs> or, oh yeah, they have to be different. Yeah. Be sorry, different. sorry. Okay. If, but if you eat like bell peppers, then if you eat three different colors, they count as three different items. Okay. So it's not as hard as you think. Are you mostly plant-based? So I was having an interesting conversation yesterday with someone about, I've always been mostly plant-based. Same. I've always eaten fish and seafood as well, but it's kind of, I have to make the effort to eat it. Yeah. I could very happily just be vegetarian. But recently, I have read about the importance of increasing protein in your life. Okay. So for that reason, I've started eating more dairy and tofu and seafood. Yeah. And even a little bits of um, organic grass-fed meat than okay. I ever would have before. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you can get protein from plants and nuts and seeds not really and, enough to be honest and lentils and chickpeas and beans yeah so i um actually like tracked my macros for a while just to like see because yeah. I, I thought that but because those things are quite high in carbohydrate as well to get the percentage of, of you know fat carbohydrate and protein uh -huh. right it's very difficult to do that if you're mostly plant-based interesting yeah i will say this though my ex who was vegan because i've been vegan for 12 years and he was vegan for a few years before I met him. But anyway, he went to get his blood work done. And at this point, he had been vegan for a decade. And they said the only thing wrong with his, with his blood work was that his protein levels were too high. Really? Yes. But does he take like pow protein powder shakes no, and stuff? No, but we were obsessed with lentil curry. And we would make it, I'm not kidding you, every night. Mm. So it's like spinach lentil. It was sog dal. Oh every God. night. I love it. Have you discovered black dal yet? No, oh, what is it? Oh my God, it's the best thing ever. Really? Yeah. And actually it's quite hard to, to source it in London. So I often buy it when I'm here. What is it? So it's beluga lentils, which are dark skinned, obviously. Yeah, yeah. And it's a slightly different way of making it to regular dal. Okay. But it is so delicious. Oh and my I've gosh. learned how to make it. Yeah. Oh. You've got to try it. I need to. It's addict. I, I, I felt like I was addicted to it mm. in, in a good way. Can you? Dal is the ultimate comfort food, I think. Mm. And I've also um, buy black rice now as well. Ooh. And black chickpeas. Okay, black um, chickpeas. Yeah. Whoa. So it's blowing my mind. I know. Okay. Normally I would say like, you know, purple sprouting broccoli instead of, you know, just always having green broccoli and blueberries instead of like raspberries or strawberries all the time. Okay. But these, yeah, if I can find a version of anything in, in like, dark yeah. like black or dark reddish brown purple i'm obsessed with that wow awesome okay so that there's your healthy diet and then where were we oh and fermented foods they're good Ooh. for your gut and the gut brain axis you know benefits from that okay really the easiest way to hack your brain is through your gut because it's very hard to do it directly because you don't see your brain you don't you know um necessarily think about all the choices that you're making. But if you're making your food choices in a brain first way, that's great. Um, you know, not being sedentary, but also like deep breathing because with stress, people tend to like shallow breathe or hold their breath. Oh, I want to talk about stress. I'm f***ing stressed right now. If someone like breaks and laughs during a take, I leave it in. Yeah. Just because I like it. Yeah. It's just feels natural yeah. and you know yeah, and it's contagious so. yes that it's contagious <laughs> it's like why we love watching actors break like on did you ever watch saturday night live or anything like that um i have seen it we, yeah. yeah and when they laugh it's just the best mm. and you find yourself laughing too but stress so so all this healthy diet and 
um, exercising isn't going to make that much of a difference if we're chronically stressed. Yeah, I always say, you know what, try and do those those healthy things like sleep eight hours a night, eat healthily, exercise. Why, is, why eight hours? Um, well, the, the research actually shows that in population norm studies, which is most of the population, but not the outlying 5%, that eight hours and 15 minutes is ideal. Okay. And actually, if you have more than that, it's not good for you. It's not good for your metabolism. And it's also, it can actually induce depression. Whoa. So we don't want to oversleep. But we need seven to eight hours to clean that out the brain overnight. So there's a very active cleansing process that goes on that takes that long. Um, and sleeping on your side is best for that process as well. Okay. But with, of all these things that we've just discussed, I always say don't stress out about it too much because it's the stress that will kill you in the end. Whoa. And stress literally kills brain cells. That's why I'm so stupid. <laughs> Chronic stress, though, I, I will say it's really interesting you say that because since my divorce, which it, I'm still going through, but it's been mm -hmm. almost two years, it'll be two years in August, and I have been more chronically stressed. Mm -hmm. Like you just are, mm -hmm. you know, lots of trauma, and mm -hmm. and I find that I'm more bloated. And it's interesting you talk mm -hmm. about like belly fat mm -hmm. and stress. Also, you you talk about it affecting your skin. And I've yeah. had breakouts on my body for a long time. So maybe I've been wrestling with stress for a long time. I don't know. But it's so interesting the way that it affects your physical body. And then I've also felt like just not as switched on mm -hmm. as I normally mm -hmm. am. And it's frustrating at times. And I wonder, I feel like I'm getting a hold of it now. Like I'm doing a lot of hot yoga, which is incredible. Do you ever do hot mm. yoga? Oh my God. Just that. You feel I, so clean afterwards. Yeah. Right? yeah. And I kind of like feeling like I'm going to die, but I don't. <laughs> it's, you know, it's just really intense. I don't know. I like the sweating. I like the intensity mm -hmm. of it. And I feel afterwards. Yeah. You feel so clean and so clear so inspired um but so let's pick yeah. up on that sentence of okay. i feel like i'm gonna die but i don't okay you can treat the journey that you've had to navigate around your divorce in that way it's if we think about this phrase what doesn't kill you makes you stronger i've been through exactly the same as you my first marriage was 11 years and it took you know a good few years to really get over like the process of the divorce wow. but i do remember learning after that that I had a level of resilience I hadn't quite appreciated before. Mm. And that I wanted to remember that I had that in case I ever needed to call upon it again. Mm -hmm. And it was after when I was around, you know, your stage of that, that I started changing my gratitude list from things that were very external, like my friends, my family, my ability to travel, to things that were more qualities that I had in me that I could use to help me deal with stress. So things like my creativity, my vulnerability, my resilience, my ability to ask for help. Wow. I started wow. really like bringing to the top of my mind that these were these were things that I was grateful for. And that was a big game changer for me. So okay. I hope maybe that's something that you can. I love that. Yeah. I absolutely love that. Cause I do, I do my morning like gratitude walk where I'll just walk around my block and I make a gratitude list. I think about everything I'm happy and grateful for for the first five minutes or so. And then I spend the next five minutes visualizing what I want. I big, big, huge into visualization. Yeah. I, I swear it's once I started doing that, everything changed for me. Mm -hmm. But, um, so I do do that, but it is more external. It is mm -hmm. like my kids mm -hmm. and you know, I do see my health, but okay. Mm -hmm. I love that. Mm -hmm. My, uh, my resilience, my strength. Yeah. And try to like, Get your because it can also become very repetitive. So yeah. try to come up with new things more often than you usually do, because if you push yourself to do that, you'll just dig deeper and find more qualities that you've got, and it's so helpful for you. Okay, I'm not going to say my kids anymore. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but find. I mean, things. to be honest, your kid nearly did ruin this episode. <laughs> she really did. <laughs> she really did. She almost pissed on the couch. She was this close, <laughs> and I was like being forced to wear the Peppa Pig ears. <laughs> until minutes before we started filming <laughs> seconds <laughs> sorry about that <laughs> yeah you're right <laughs> little shits um okay all right that's good gratitude exercise 
What else can help with chronic stress? Well, anything that or stress in general. Yeah, stress. Yeah, anything that connects the mind and the body, like yoga. So yoga actually means union, and it is the fact that your mind is not just up here in your brain; it's embodied. So when you're in a certain pose, your mind is focused, like in that area of your body. Wow, that's what you know. We believe in yoga. So and yoga is not just about poses; it's about gratitude. It's about breath work. It's about detoxing the body. Yeah. Um, so all of those all of those things that fall under the umbrella of mindfulness, physical exercise does help to sweat out the stress hormone as well. Yeah. And then things like journaling or talking to a, a therapist or a you know a psychologically minded friend. Yeah. Also helps you to just get those survival emotions out of the brain body system. I was just going to ask you why is journaling so effective? Because I'll be just on one. I'll be just so stressed or in fear or I get triggered by my boyfriend he'll say one thing that's not even a big deal but it triggers something mm -hmm. deep in me and I'm like ah and then I go and I journal on mm -hmm. my laptop and boom I feel so much better just stream of consciousness just yeah. writing if you read my journal you would think I, sh I should be committed <laughs> I'm sure everybody <laughs> thinks that's about their journal right okay. um <laughs> so I think there's the offloading part obviously but do you ever read back over it? Rarely, rarely. Because where you've Sometimes. said, I get triggered, you know, by something my boyfriend says. Yeah. And it feels like you didn't say this, but it feels like you were inferring that you don't always know why. Yes. Like the reactions are just too big for what happened. Yeah. So the first thing that came into my mind is, you know, potentially hormones and kind of, you know, monthly cycle could make a difference to that. But then it could also be that you have some triggers that are still in your shadow that you're not aware of. And yeah. so that's why you react in a way, because it takes you back to that little girl that thinks you're not going to get the love that you need to survive. Mm. So if you do read over your journal, what you might start to see is patterns. So, a, you know, a very basic physiological one would be that every time you get triggered by your boyfriend, it's when you've got, you know, premenstrual. Sure, yeah. sure. But, but there might be more subtle ones, which might show up as, you know, if it's because you haven't been sleeping well and you're not able to regulate, regulate your emotions as much. Wow. You know, going back to what you were saying about not feeling as switched on. Yeah. Because you've had yeah. so much to deal with in the last couple of years. When we're chronically stressed, one of the things the brain does is it goes into low power mode. Oh, my God. So it actually won't give up the blood supply, which carries the glucose and the oxygen that we need to think. It's not going to give that up for being creative, being funny, solving complex problems, thinking outside the box. It's going to think, no, I, all I need to do is survive. I need to take care of my kids, put food on the table. Yes. That's enough. Yes. Wow. That's how I feel. Mm. How, do I, how do we fix that? So... All, all of the things that we've, we've spoken about, you start your day with gratitude, you okay. do visualization, you do yoga. Mm -hmm. Maybe I would just press you a little bit further to ask if you are doing exercise that's maybe too intense. Oh. Hot yoga is quite stressful for the body. <laughs> um, it's only uh, 120 degrees in there. It's not that big of a deal. I'm just only in a headstand for 90 minutes. Okay, that's in fine. A <laughs> Okay, so maybe like a lighter, but that would be like the walk, right? Wouldn't that yeah. like 20 minutes of walking? Is yeah. that, that's exercise, yeah. right? Yeah, and, and maybe yoga that's not always hot yoga. Got well. it. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I don't know if you meditate, but you visualize, so it's kind of a similar thing. Sometimes I meditate. Mm -hmm. I, I, use, I, I go through phases. Sometimes mm -hmm. I'm really good at it or do it consistently. Sometimes, because I needed guided for a long time. And mm. then just recently... I'm reading this book called What the Buddha Taught, and they talk about just breathing, just focusing on your breath yeah. for five to 10 minutes yeah, a day. Yeah, just yeah. I'm inhaling, I'm exhaling, that's it. Mm. That's been kind of cool. Or a mantra. So maybe when you're doing your new gratitude list, or if there's a, a particular thing that you're focused on that maybe you feel like you've lost, you know, like you said, I'm not switched. I'm not a switched on. Yes. So you could have a mantra that is like, I am so switched on. I am super switched on. Ooh, affirm it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I find like, I don't feel like I see a lot of neuroscientists that believe in or talk about the law of attraction, mm. but you do. I do. <laughs> Let's talk about that. 
<laughs> um, well, it kind of happened by mistake. Okay. So it was I, an accident. It was. A, I didn't mean to. Yeah. <laughs> it goes back to what I was saying about keeping my personal spiritual practice separate from my professional life. So after I got divorced, I became very interested in Jungian psychology and Buddhism. And somebody had given me, the, a friend, a school, high school friend, had given me this book called The Master Key System. Okay. And I had read the book, but not done any of the exercises. It originally came out in 1926 as a series of newspaper columns weekly. So that basically each chapter has an exercise that you have to do at the end of it. Cool. So after I got divorced, I remembered the book and I thought maybe I should do the exercises and that's going to help me get my, you know, feel switched on again, get myself back on track. Yes. Exactly what you're going through. Yes. So I did these exercises really seriously. You had to do the exercise until you completely got it, like physically, emotionally, mentally, everything. Then you could move on to the next chapter. It took me about six months. Wow. So for me, those were the things, the psychology, the kind of Eastern philosophy and that practice particularly, which was very much a you know, a mastery of your emotions and your mental processes. Okay. Um, so I guess that was on my mind. And then in 2017, I became the world's first neuroscientist in residence at a five-star hotel in London. Whoa. Um, and so there was a lot of press interest in that because it was kind of unusual. They usually yeah. had an artist in residence, but this was like wow. a change. Yeah. That's really cool. And then Penguin Random House approached me and said, We've got really, you know, books that have done really well, one on diet, one on sleep, one on mindfulness, one on exercise. And we think as a neuroscientist that you could write one that would bring all of those things together. And I basically just heard myself saying, I could do that, but I've got this idea about vision boards and visualization. <laughs> and they loved it. Whoa. Yeah. So then I wasn't sure if I, how much I would be able to write. So I just first spent a couple of weeks researching what are the laws of attraction um, and can they be explained by cognitive science? And very quickly, I realized that psychology and neuroscience could really explain this. And for me, what the, the difference that made was that instead of believing that it was like the universe and frequencies and vibrations and something outside of me, I felt like I could like drive that process myself. And that okay. felt really empowering. So it's not because it, they talk about like quantum physics. Mm. Is that... Is that how you would explain the law of attraction? Because I don't really understand quantum physics. Well, no, I'm not a quantum it, physicist. It confuses me. <laughs> yeah, like, I know. What? For me, I, I just look at it as I focus on what I want rather than what I don't. And I put my attention and focus on to what I want consistently mm. in the morning, at night, mm. visualizing, and then it, things start to manifest. Yeah, but the it's thing more is, practical. Laura, you're not just walking in your garden and sitting around visualizing and paying attention to these things. You're working really hard every day and putting stuff out there Yes, that is relevant to the things that you want. But I have to believe that it's possible. You do, you do, but um, that's why I don't call... I call vision boards action boards. Okay, I like because, that. Yeah, I believe that you have to do have, something. Do, <laughs> actually, do something. Um, okay. But some people find it hard to visualize. There's something called aphantasia, which is you, my sister you actually, has that. You can't actually visualize. Yeah. Um, so creating a vision board is great, especially because if you like, keep they it, can't see in picture, right? No. Isn't that crazy? And there's, there's actually a scale of it. So some people will close their eyes and try to picture an apple. It will literally just be black space. Yes. Some people might see like a blobby round shape and some people can actually see an apple. Yeah. Yeah. So. Can different. you see an apple? I can see an apple. Yeah. You think you're better? <laughs> think you're better. <laughs> do, you, do you know what I've worked out though? If I can't visualize something. Yeah. Every single time that's happened to me with a major decision, like a job or something. If I, if I can't, I've learned, it means it's not for me. Whoa. Yeah. Wow. I feel like I identify with that. Mm. I've tried to visualize certain things and it's been difficult mm. and a struggle and you're trying and you're like forcing it. Yeah. You think you really want it, but for some reason it's not. And yeah. And that's, what is that? Is that your intuition? I think so. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So action boards. Okay, so you make the board because mm -hmm. then it's easier than remembering to visualize every day or, you know, if you can't visualize, then it's, e it's just good to look at the images. Yeah. And if you place it somewhere that you're likely to see it at least once or twice a day, like near your bed, that's great. Um, so I say create the board, 
visualize everything on it being true and give gratitude for the fact that those things are true. And you do that in present tense. Yeah. Right? Yeah. As if you've already achieved these things. Yeah. Okay. That's an important kind of little tweak for the brain. Okay. Because the brain doesn't like uncertainty or new things. Why is that? It's a survival mechanism. Mm -hmm. You know, basically something like an animal, a predator that you've never seen before. Mm. Of course, you're going to like assume that it's, it's a predator. Yeah. Um, because otherwise you would die. Sure. You went up to pet it and yeah. it ate you. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then uncertainty is just very, very stressful for the brain. So we like to know what's going to happen next. We like to be in control of it. Obviously, in this modern day, that's not the case most of the time. That's, that's probably the biggest cause of stress now. Is what? Is not, you know, feeling like you don't know, you're not in control of what's going to happen next in your life or in the world. You know, we've got what? wars, we've got yeah. diseases, um, yeah. financial instability. So that's, that's what's stressful for us now. But some of the way that we're wired to deal with that stress is how we dealt with the saber-toothed tiger. Mm -hmm. So it's not really... It's not productive. No. Or good for us, actually. Mm. So you're kind of fighting with your brain? Well, this is, so in a way, you could be. And so the way that I try to live is so that, you know, I've got my brain's back and my brain's got my back. Mm. Like, we're in alignment. But when your brain is like, no, it's not safe, Tar, and you're like, yes, it is. And your brain's like, no, it's not. <laughs> Why is my brain? Why does my brain have an American accent? <laughs> Your brain's American, Tara. <laughs> Just deal with it. Um, <laughs> we got to get out of here. Your brain is from Chicago. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But what do you? So how do you? If your brain, your your brain has your back, and you have your brains. Yeah. So when I feel like. I'm, I'm not sure how something's going to turn out. Yeah. I'm anxious about something turning out badly. Yeah. And I really got this from the master key system, but you do have to do the whole process um, or like the process that I outline in the source to, to get there. I can't just tell people this, like you have to get it. But what I've realized is that if I change my mindset, things change in the material world around me. And what is your mindset? Well, if I'm thinking, oh, I'm not sure that's going to work out, I'm just worried about, you know, this next job situation or something, then I'll either use affirmations or I will, you know, test my thinking. I'll say, is that true? Is this really likely to fail? Mm. And a lot of the time, it's just your brain trying to protect you. Yeah. So when you are facing something uncertain, the amygdala and the hippocampus, which are the emotional centers and the memory centers, they get together and they dredge up your most negative memories of something like that. Like the last time you went, you know, you started dating again. That's a the, dick move. I know. Okay. So you have to be able to override that. Right. How so? Well, by knowing about it is 50% of the battle. Right. Just going, oh, my brain's just doing this thing. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Understanding. Your and brain. actually this is kind of, bear with me. It's kind of related. Okay. But when we get food cravings often, especially if they're quite unhealthy ones, yeah. it's actually because your gut microbiome, which is made up of like all sorts of bacteria and viruses and parasites, they can actually kind of change their form and go and like move between those things. They're intent on their own survival. You know, they're independent species living in our bodies. Wow. So if you crave sugar or caffeine or, you know, just like loads of carbs or whatever, mm. Think of the little gremlins in your gut as separate to you and ask yourself, am I going to let this gremlin use me as an avatar to eat sugar so it can survive when Whoa. that's going to be bad for me? Or am I going to say, no, I make the choices of what I eat? Wow. And so I wouldn't call our brains little gremlins, but sometimes it is a good idea to step back a little bit. It's yeah. kind of like, yeah. you know how... It's so easy to give your sisters advice, yeah. but it's harder for you to like, think of it for yourself. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like that. It's just one step of separation from your own uh, over-identifying with your own brain. Wow. That's really fascinating. Okay, so then what's the next step? I want to talk about the principles from your book. Mm -hmm. That was really interesting to me. Principle one, and this is to use the law of attraction, right? Mm -hmm. So abundance is principle one. And you talk about selective thinking and what was the other one, tagging? What value tags, yeah, value tags. Can you talk about that? Yeah. 
so um, with the abundance one, what I found out was that there isn't even actually universal agreement about what the laws of attraction are. So I put, I put them into six categories where I saw similar themes. How would you define the law of attraction first? Well, honestly, go and Google it because it's not very well defined. Right. Yeah. That's a so I couldn't rely on anybody else's definition. I had to like redefine it for the purposes of the source. Okay. Um, so where there were similar themes, I put them into the same category. So abundance is basically overriding this scarcity mindset that we can have. Okay. Which we've just talked about, what, like why we have it and how the brain tries to protect you. Okay. And then manifestation is this idea of if I change my mindset, then things can change in the world around me. So I can create in the real world the things that I want by changing the way that I think, what I believe about myself, the emotions that you know I'm experiencing, and therefore how I act in the, in the real world. Okay. Magnetic desire is a fully aligned strong emotion that you actually want the things that you've put on your vision board because it's very easy you know kind of like at your age or a bit younger to say well I want to get engaged and married and have a family because that's what all my friends are doing mm. do you actually really want that right right um, so you know in your head your logic in your heart your emotions in your gut your intuition do all three parts of yourself want the things that you say you want what are the three parts again um, head, heart, and gut. Head, heart, and, and gut. they correlate with logic, emotion, and intuition. Whoa. Okay. Okay. So ask your head, heart, and gut, mm -hmm. do I really want this? Ask them separately and then wait for the answer because you'll get a logical answer, an emotional answer, and an intuitive answer. Oh my goodness. I love that. And that's magnetic desire. If they're all aligned, then it's magnetic desire. And the importance of magnetic desire is that when you are... When, when you're setting a goal and trying to reach it, you're yeah. basically creating a behavior change in your own brain. And so to overwrite old behavior patterns in the brain, you need to build a new pathway where neurons connect up with each other, neurons that fire together, wire together, you know, and create a new pathway that is your new way of being. Is that neuroplasticity? That's neuroplasticity. But the brain is quite lazy, so it prefers to keep doing what it was doing before because that's easier. Okay. So it can feel like you're working really hard, you're journaling, you're visualizing, and nothing's changing. Mm. Because it takes, until there's a tipping point of, of the right number of neurons to create a thicker pathway for the new behavior, and then suddenly it feels like everything falls into place. Mm. But a lot of people give up before they get to that point. But do they give up because they didn't really have that magnetic desire? Because maybe their head liked the idea of them getting that house, but their gut really didn't yeah. need all exactly. that space. Exactly. Is that why? Yeah. I find like for me in the past, if I had a goal and it doesn't align, although I didn't like articulate it in that way, mm -hmm. but I thought I wanted something and I didn't want it bad enough, so mm -hmm. I stopped putting my focus on it or mm -hmm. visualizing it and, it, and it didn't manifest. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, and that's why patience is actually the fourth Okay, part. so patience so that's is patience. Wait, but you never talked about sel um, selective thinking. I'll come back to that. Okay, we're coming back. That's the mechanism back. behind all of this. Stuff. So these got are it, the six it, themes got it, got it, that I put it in. Got it, okay, okay. And the last two, harmony and universal connection, are just about the fact that... Patience. Patience was about the tipping point till you, till you have that new neural pathway where it can feel like nothing's happening. Okay. So you, you have to wait. You know, you can't say like, okay, I want to manifest this and it didn't happen in two days. So now I'm like, you know, yeah. it's failed and I'll move on to the next thing. Understanding that it, it's physiologically hard work going on in your brain. Yeah. So you might want to give up, but you need to be patient. But you need to be patient. Yeah. And also find joy and gratitude in the now the process as well in the process yeah yeah, yeah. process 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 <laughs> <laughs> don't i'm gonna start speaking in an american accent now process just be a full valley girl the second half of it <laughs> um anyway um back to the process yeah so well <laughs> <laughs> yeah um yeah so the, <laughs> the mechanisms that are going on in the brain behind all of this stuff yeah. is selective filtering, selective attention, and value tagging.
Mm. So we experience so much data and information in a day that we can't process at all. So the brain naturally feels like, <laughs> you're making me giggle. <laughs> This is just me existing. This is why I got into comedy because I would just sit there and people would laugh and I'm like, oh, I guess I should do something with this. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, so the brain filters out stuff that it doesn't consider <laughs> vital to our survival. <laughs> okay, yeah, I'll just look this way. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm just not gonna look at you. Okay. Okay. Um, and then mm -hmm. the brain pays attention to the things that you've primed it, okay. that you say are what you want in your life. And then the value tagging is that the brain actually tags these things in order of importance. Whoa. Now, if you don't tell your brain the order, it's going to do it based on survival. But if you're visualizing, if you've got a board, then you're priming your brain okay. with like what's most important to you. Okay. And so the selective thinking that's by using the action board, right? Mm -hmm. Action board? Is that what mm -hmm, you call it? Mm -hmm. um, and, and focusing on that, I assume twice a day or how, how much do you recommend focusing on? I mean, I do it twice a day cause it's right next to my bed. Yeah, yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Okay. And by doing that, you're teaching your brain to utilize selective thinking. That's some selective attention, selective attention. Yeah. Sorry. Selective so that's attention. noticing potential opportunities that could move you closer to your goals. Yeah. And then the value tagging would help you to actually grasp those opportunities. And put them in order mm -hmm. of importance. Yeah, and, and actually act on them. So if, there's, okay. if something comes up and you think, oh, that could lead to me to getting this acting job, that you actually like go for it and you don't just kind of let it go by you. That's wild. I, that reminds me of a story years and years ago when I lived in an apartment with my best friend. Mm -hmm. I got locked out of my house at like eight in the morning. My friend went to work all day. I just didn't have a key. So I was like, what am I going to do? Mm -hmm. So I walked to a local cafe. Did you say we have two minutes? Okay. So I walked to a local, <laughs> so I walked to a local <laughs> cafe and um, I started sitting down. And at the time I was like a very hungry actress. I really wanted to work and it was on my mind. I was obsessive about it. Mm -hmm. And I sit down at this cafe and I thought, well, I'll just talk to strangers all day for eight hours until my <laughs> roommate gets home. And so I start just talking to everyone around me, asking them about them. And it was really interesting. There's this one guy sitting there and he looked really familiar. And I was like, huh? So I sit down at his table. I was like, you look really familiar. And he's like, um, I don't know you. And I was like, anyway, what are you ordering today? This place is really good avocado toast. And he was like, uh, I'm actually meeting someone here. I'm like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. Okay. Bye. Walk away. About a week later, I get a phone call from an unknown number. So I pick it up. I say, hello. And he goes, Laura. And I said, yeah. And he goes, Hey, he goes, this is Peter. I met you at Kings Road Cafe. You just sat at my table and started talking to me. And I was like, oh my God, Peter, hi. I was like, how did you get my number? Yeah. And he goes, well, I realized why I looked familiar to you. I'm friends with your sister's fiance. And I think we had met at a party one day. And oh. that's how, that's why I looked familiar. And I was like, oh my gosh. He goes, anyway, I'm a director and I'm directing this series for AMC and I'm casting the role of a crazy actress. And I think you'd be perfect. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, wow, I was like, great. He's like, come in for the audition tomorrow. And I was like, great. And I booked the role. I get this like three episode series, but I don't know if that's, if that like connects to what you're saying here, how it was in my mind, mm -hmm. I was focused on getting a role. And then I was opening up to P or is that just me being psychotic? Do you know what's making me think of something that I haven't really spoken about much, but I'm, I'm researching at the moment, Yeah, which is about expanding our consciousness mm -hmm. because it would be very e easy to say that was a coincidence. And actually, you know, you took a bad day and you made it into a friendly thing and you just spoke to random people, right? Could be that. But the fact that you felt that he looked familiar and he was kind of like, I don't know you. Yes. Is that because you remembered his face potentially from being at a party or is it because somehow your spidey senses knew that he might be somebody that could give you an opportunity that you wanted? Maybe. You know, in ancient times, there were like shamans and medicine women. Yeah. And um, actually there was a practice in some of the really ancient cultures like the Greeks and the Egyptians mm -hmm. of burying people so that they had like a near death experience. And Whoa. they became like the seers and the mystics. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, so, you know, oh, there's, okay, has this ever happened to you? 
you think of someone you haven't been in touch with for a long time and suddenly they message you. Yes. Like, yes. there is no one that I've asked that question to that hasn't said yes to that. Yeah. How does that work? How does that work? Well, we don't know the answer, but I'm starting to look into it. And one of the things I've looked at is how the first Americans view time. Now, time is a, it's a man-made construct. Yeah. Time doesn't necessarily work in a straight line. We've just said that it does. Mm -hmm. But in the um, indigenous nations, they view time as a spiral, which means that you go past places that you've been before repeatedly. Well. And that's one explanation potentially for serendipity. Mm. or coincidence. Um, so, you know, I think that potentially our consciousness is capable of a lot more than we think it is right now. Yeah. And that maybe we've even limited ourselves with modern science wow. to, to thinking like the brain works like this. Uh -huh. You know, we have language. So if I say something to you, then you just have to accept that at face value. But actually... We, you know, we're constantly monitoring each other's micromuscular facial expressions and body language mm. and picking up other things and just what you're saying. And like when I was looking at your face and I could tell that you like, you, you wanted to laugh and then it made me giggle. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then stress is also contagious. So if one of us had high levels of cortisol, let's say I got here late and I was like really hot and sweaty and a bit nervous about doing the interview with you. Mm -hmm. But I didn't really want to show that, so I like tried to suppress it and say, oh, I'm fine, I'm fine, let's just get on with it. You would actually pick up on my stress levels, like physically, mm. in the same way that women who live or work closely together synchronize their menstrual cycles. Stress, regardless of gender, has an effect on the people around us. You know, like... It's actually contagious. Yeah. That's wild. So we're communicating actually already on three levels, hormonal body language and verbal. And the period sinking, that was what everyone needed to be fertile at the same time. So the alpha male could pass on Bang them all. Yeah. Disgusting. So <laughs> men have always been disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. Oh my God. <laughs> Trash. Okay. <laughs> Those cavemen. <laughs> Man, but mm. I guess you can't blame them, right? Bastards. <laughs> okay, but sorry. So it was, it was so the women could all be fertile at the same time, right? That's why? Yeah, because like, <laughs> because, you know, in those days, there were so many miscarriages and stillbirths right. and hypothermia and predators. So the alpha male had to impregnate four or five women to make sure that at least one would, you know, his genes would get passed on. <laughs> I don't know why your cameraman is like looking quite so pleased with himself. <laughs> Well, he's gay, so. <laughs> now, okay, so. <laughs> but okay, so we're communicating with each other already. In three ways. In three ways. So, you know, what I want to look into now with my research is whether there's more than that. So this wow. thing about someone messaging you, you know, after a long time when you thought of them, what's, how do we explain that? Twins, you know, they, they have kind of like, more of a connection than regular people, but could we have that? Whoa. And I've had weird stuff like that happen mm -hmm. to me through my life, and I'm, I feel like everyone has. Like the thing at the coffee shop, like was it a coincidence or was there something else? I just want to pose the question that let's just say it's not a coincidence. Yeah. Let's go from that hypothesis. So if that wasn't a coincidence and you have some kind of, let's call it intuition, that leads you to focus on someone specifically that ended up getting you a job that you were very hungry for, mm -hmm. wouldn't you want to do more of that? Yes. Wouldn't you want to hone that skill? Yes. Yeah, that's, that's where I'm going next with my research. That's really exciting. And how would you hone that skill? Well, what I'm going to have to do first is gather some data. Mm -hmm. So even like when you say, I've got so many strange stories like that, yeah. I would love to hear those stories. I would love to speak to lots of people and... Um, you know, find more stories. Okay, I'll tell you one more. <laughs> so it was like, I was newly sober. I've been sober for 12 years. Mm -hmm. I was going into the uh, recovery rooms mm -hmm. and it was like one of my first meetings. I was a newcomer. I was really nervous. Mm -hmm. And I raised my hand as a newcomer. And after the meeting, this guy is a gay meeting. So it's me and like 15 gay men. <laughs> 
it, this guy comes up to me named, oh, actually shouldn't say his name. <laughs> it comes up to me, he goes, sweetie, he goes, let me take you to the Thai restaurant and I'll, and I'll tell you about alcoholism. Let's go. And I was like, okay, cool. Like, that's great. He's being of service. This is so nice. Mm. Like one alcoholic teaching another, like, mm -hmm. this is great. So we sit down and he pulls out the big book, this book um, for this 12 step program. Yeah. And he starts reading it to me like really loud and, and at this restaurant. And I'm so embarrassed because like nobody knows that I'm trying to get sober. Oh. And he's reading like alcoholism. It's a fatally progressive disease and you have it. You know, and I'm just like, <laughs> shut up. Like, can we be quiet about it? Yeah. Anyway, I was like kind of embarrassed. And I look to the right and I see this woman. She's like drinking her wine, like listening, <laughs> like, oh my God, like, who are these people anyway then the the bill comes and he's like oh can you buy this <laughs> and i was like oh sure so i think he just wanted a free meal but <laughs> anyway that's besides the point so then about a week later i go to another meeting and it's like underground in this parking garage and i'm sitting there and it's like 7 a.m and i look to the right and this woman looks really familiar and i was like huh that's weird then she's looking at me and then she comes up to me after she goes excuse me i just want to say thank you she goes mm -hmm. my doctor told me that i had a severe alcohol problem and i was ignoring it and ignoring it and i was sitting in a restaurant alone having wine and i heard you t um talking about alcohol alcoholism wow. and I considered that my sign to get sober and she goes I just want to thank you like comes up to me and literally says this loud conversation is like what brought her to the rooms and I just thought that was so crazy yeah and it was also like I had never really been to that meeting so it was like the this is a big city and mm. what is the likelihood of us like showing up at the same time and, like her being there and her sitting there and yeah. her listening to us and him reading loudly like it was all so we call that in the rooms a God shot when it's mm -hmm. like such a coincidence where mm -hmm. you're like, and I've had things like that happen mm -hmm. and you just, it's hard to explain and you just go, oh, it's a coincidence, whatever. Exactly. Or is it? Yeah, I think we're doing it a disservice. And I had a visceral <sighs> reaction to you telling me that story. Like I felt like it, this was like an, a, a miracle. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Wild. Mm. So that's really exciting. Yeah. Cool. Do you have stories like that? Um, so signs are, you know, you use signs. that word. And I, it's the kind of thing I would notice like ever oh. since I was a kid, probably. Mm. Um, and so, you know, I believe that your angels come to you when you need them. So like if a friend calls you out of the blue and she's particularly like helpful about a situation you're wow. in or something like that. Yes. Um, yes. And I do read my own tarot and stuff like that. Oh, fun. Yeah. But I, so I will like see, you know, something in the shape of a heart or a feather or, a, you know, a bird and kind of think it's a sign. Mm. But what I've been trying to do more recently since I've decided I want to look into this area of research is actually ask for something specific that's really obscure and then wait to see if it happens. Oh, cool. Um, so I've been experimenting with that recently and I would love it if the, if, you know, if the listeners did that too and then like shared with us. Totally. Mm. Yeah. That's really, really cool. Okay, did we finish this? So then we have harmony and then universal connection. Yeah, so I mean, both of those are really about the fact that you sh your goals can't be something that harms someone else. Damn it. Shit. I need to make a new list. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You do, know, you do know that if you do witchcraft <laughs> and like put a curse on someone, it comes back to you three times as strongly. Okay. That's fine. I would never do that. No, I, I wouldn't. Actually, okay. All right. Continue. Um, <laughs> and the universal connection piece is kind of like about the concept that we are all connected in some way and, you know, a Jungian psychology speaks about the collective unconscious. So mm -hmm. it's almost like there might be some access to the cloud in terms of like things that we can think and know, you know, not unconnected to what we were just saying. Yeah. Um, so yeah, basically that, you know, there's enough out there for everyone. You don't, what you're trying to achieve or gain shouldn't be to the detriment of anyone else. Right. And that there is some kind of like collective consciousness that, could you could tap into to help you to reach the things that you want as well. Wow. And you talk about your tribe and being really intentional with who is in your tribe mm. and, and how, how do we decipher that? Because I know 
a lot of people have family members that maybe they struggle with or friends they've had a long time. Mm. Like, how do you pick your tribe and mm. how do you weed them out? Yeah, I mean, ideally, the longer that, you know, they've, you've been friends with them, the level of trust yeah. is high. Yeah. Um, you can absolutely meet friends later in life that you just really click with and gel with and, and a bond forms, you know, relatively quickly. Yeah. If we think about that phrase, you are the sum of the five people that you spend the most time with, or mm. it's not necessarily always time, it's kind of the impact that they have on you, right? So there's an exercise in the book, but there's two versions of it, which I call the people tree or the family tree. Yes, yes. So basically you draw a tree with five big branches and then you name the five people that you think influence you the most. Mm -hmm. And that could be friends or family. You can do one for family and separate one for friends or you could mix it. And then you write five words to describe each of those people. Okay. And these can be positive or negative. Yeah. Um, and then you have to meditate on those 25 words mm. until you can accept that they are all descriptions of you. And if you have a Whoa. strong trigger against some of those words, Mosquito. Yeah. You bastard. Okay. All right. Then it's probably in your shadow. So if you look at these words and you say, Whoa. one of my friends is quite selfish, let's say. And you look at it and you say, but I'm not selfish. So no, I can't accept that. You have to keep med meditating until you accept, okay, there is a, a part of me or a form of me that can be selfish sometimes. Wow. And by doing that, you're actually integrating your shadow because you're accepting parts of yourself that you've rejected. Okay. Um, you often are quite triggered by behaviors in other people that's in your shadow. Say that one more time. So if you see a behavior in someone else yeah. and it really bothers you, yeah, yeah. It, it sometimes it's yeah. because it's in your shadow. Yeah, yeah. that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Is that projecting? Yeah, I guess it's a form of projecting. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So you make the tree and mm -hmm. then you list out the, the five people and then mm -hmm. five words that describe each yeah. of them and then you meditate on the fact that those words all actually describe you. Wow. Yeah. And then I guess if you're disturbed by that, it's time to readjust or mm -hmm. is it just about acceptance? Um, well, I think that will, that will depend on a case by case yeah, basis. So yeah. like, it's very hard to like give an, ex there, there will be examples where yeah. some of it you have to accept and examples where some, some of it you might have to adjust. And just to add to that social contagion piece, mm -hmm. um, things like the research has been done on divorce and obesity, particularly mm -hmm. that in your social circle, if one of those things happens to someone that, you know, yeah. it's more likely to happen to you in the next year. Now that doesn't actually mean that that you know that obesity is contagious or di getting divorced so is contagious. So don't hang out with divorced people or fat people. Well, ever. <laughs> it's ever the thing is, that, you stay know, away. <laughs> you might you might actually be in an unhappy marriage, but feel that it's really socially unacceptable to get divorced. But you get permission from somebody in your social circle. So hang that. out with divorced people if <laughs> if. You think that that, you know, right. your life might be better if you move on to a different relationship. Yeah. But that's a super interesting fact. Sorry. So if you, if you hang out with a divorced person, you're how much more likely to? I'm, I, I don't recall the percentage, yeah. but you're more likely to in the next year. But, but obviously yeah. that would only be the case if there was already an issue. No, totally. Yeah. It's, it's interesting because I've talked about, not tons, but, you know, being on the internet, you know, people know what's going on in my life. And I've had a lot of women reach out saying that they were in a really dysfunctional mm -hmm. or abusive marriage and that watching me helped give them courage mm. to, to leave. So mm -hmm. it was like, you know, yeah, I do think it's, you're absolutely right. If everyone's married in your circle and you're in this dysfunctional thing, it's harder to, mm. to walk away. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Wow. Um, what else? What else? Um, so a couple, so we could go back a little bit to, because uh, I, I think you'll actually find this very funny. So you know we were talking about like sexual relationships um, yes. between people. The research is actually was done on voles. So there are, there are different types of voles. There are marsh and mountain voles that have a lot of abundance of food and shelter, mm -hmm. and they're very promiscuous. And then there are prairie um, or pine voles that 
shelter and food are few and far between, so they become monogamous. They're not as slutty. They're not slutty at all. At all. No. Wait, wow, that's really interesting. And it's a little bit of a chicken and egg situation because their oxytocin levels and vasopressin levels do change, but we don't know if it's because, you know, Mr. Vole thinks, oh, well, I might as well shack up with Laura Vole because it's going to be safer for me and we can protect our young together. Whoa. And then his hormones change. Or whether the scarcity of shelter and food causes a hormonal change that then makes him bond. We don't know exactly wow. which way around it is, but it doesn't necessarily really matter. It doesn't really matter. So, and what does that say about us? Well, I did discuss this with a friend and she basically said, don't go and live in Dubai where there's like a lot of bling and a lot of really attractive women around because your man's probably going to get tempted. Seriously, wow. The more comfortable you are, so okay. We just need to get poor. And <laughs> hungry. Hungry. Okay, I can do that. I can do that. Um. <laughs> Whoa, that's really interesting. But then some species are just monogamous and others are not. Is, mm -hmm. Does that same logic apply to those? Like, who else are monogamous? Penguins? <laughs> right? Um, yeah, I was thinking there's a particular type of small deer in South Africa that mates for life as well. Really? But I'm afraid I don't know the science <laughs> behind we why, to, we need to figure why that penguins out. are monogamous. Yeah. Okay. Wow, that's super interesting. Do you think that we are meant to be monogamous? Well, that's that's a question whose answer has changed over time. Because there if you a, think there about it, there was a period it, where well, there was a period of time where we didn't live till uh, over the age of forty. Yeah, so, and the caveman had to bang all of them at the same <laughs> time. Okay, but yeah. that's not the case anymore. We've no. evolved. We've evolved. We live for much longer now. Mm -hmm. um, I think that the idea of forever could actually be causing a lot of dissonance and unhappiness for people. Whoa. And if you think spiritually, impermanence is a really important thing to accept. Um, you know, nothing is forever. When you say the idea of forever, is that we are thinking that we're immortal? Or are you talking about marriage? Marriage, so relationships. <laughs> so say, yeah. you know, like, I'm gonna meet the one and it's gonna last forever. Right. That narrative Because it doesn't really work like that really much anymore, mm -hmm. it can only really set you up for disappointment and failure, right? Yeah. Because if you think that's the ideal, then if that doesn't happen, then what's that saying to you about yourself, your self-worth, your self-esteem, your yeah. sense of rejection, your sense of failure? So I think it comes back to something that you mentioned earlier, which is about being in the present. You know, not saying I'm going to enter into a relationship knowing that it's going to end, but just in a way, yeah. we've almost come full circle from where, from where we started. Like mm. not actually having to try to control everything, having some level of surrender to like the process of life mm. and that you're on a journey that you're meant to be on and you're going to learn something from it and wow. potentially have, you know, better experiences than you think than, than what you think you would have if you stayed on the same path. Wow. So it really is adjusting your mindset, staying present, and yeah, getting that idea of forever out of your head because that's just not realistic. Though you see some couples who are together 50 years and mm -hmm. happy, so... Yeah, in previous generations more so, I would say. What? Are we doomed? Why previous generations? Is it tender? Let's, let, let's is see. That... It's, it's, we have to like, you know, watch you for the next 50 years and see what you, we can't, we can't predict the future. Right. Right. But I mean, that is happening less and less with each generation. Can I ask you, you can say too personal, but like what happened in your marriage in your thirties when you got divorced? Can I ask you about that? Yeah. I mean, I think it's, it's, mu it's very complicated, isn't okay. it? And yes. one of the things I had to learn is it's a function of me, him, the relationship, the situations that we were in. Um, so we actually met when we were 25, which now looking back, I think that is really young yeah. to meet the person and then you know think that you're gonna marry them and be together for the rest of your life. Um, Same, by the way, 25. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, 
and and you know it was a very formative year so we kind of like grew up together in many ways mm. but and he's a you know completely wonderful person but we're quite different people and i think that you know what we wanted out of life started to you know become more different right and we didn't really know how to navigate that yeah and so we just probably didn't do it in the best possible way and we both said to each other you know that if we knew what we knew now we would have done some things differently yeah but actually we both ended up you know in a, a good and right place for us yeah and we're both happy for each other yeah of course it felt like a complete failure at the time sure but i i've got the benefit of more hindsight than you at the moment so i can say that i'm i'm absolutely aware of what i learned from that mm -hmm. and i moved on and forward with my life in a way that's more authentic for the person that I am today than the person I was age 25. Yeah, yeah. Wow, that's really cool. Um, okay, We're, I had some more questions for you. Oh, why are periods contagious? We talked about that. Men, women, sex, question mark. I don't even know what that was. What is neuroplasticity? <laughs> What is neuroplasticity? Neuroplasticity is basically the fact that the brain continues to grow and change throughout life. So we used to think that by the time you were 18 or you physically stopped growing, that your brain was set, like your personality and your intelligence and your sense of humor was like, that's, that's what you've got to play with now for the rest of your life. We know that that can actually really change. Mm -hmm. um, you know, having met your daughter, who's three, it's just such an amazing age. Their brains are just like sponges. You, know, oh, yeah. you see them just learning new things like all day, every day. Yes. And obviously that does like plateau mm -hmm. once we're 25 plus, but you can do things to force your brain to change. So what can we do? So learning that is attention intense enough. So a learning that makes you really like focus and concentrate and it's quite difficult. So things like learning a new language or learning a musical instrument, that that's hard enough that it will give you global benefits in your brain in terms of regulating your emotions and just, you know, achieving like, the highest functions of the brain. Wow. What about racket sports? I've heard that. They're really good. Yeah, they're really good. For your good. brain? Yeah, because you interviewed Do um, Dr. Armand. Didn't yeah, you? yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. But that's interesting because I, I watched in an interview of yours that you said if you're doing something over and over again, like I would say for me, it's comedy, writing comedy. Mm -hmm. I, I've done it for so long that it feels almost effortless. And you said that, that it then becomes your superpower and you become really good at it, but it's not actually helping to change and grow and strengthen my brain what I think, is it I think I said that to somebody who's a really good podcast host that dude that's yeah. the dude yeah yeah okay so he is actually kind of he's being curious but he's kind of doing the same process repeatedly yeah whereas I would say you have to come up with new material don't you so even yeah. though your process is the same yes you do have to search for something new. Yes, yes, um, yes. Which he does to an extent, but I feel like it's probably more neuroplastic <laughs> with you. Thank you. <laughs> Stop. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. I literally am actually falling in love with you, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> Okay, so great. So then learning a new skill, new language, mm -hmm. racket sports. Mm -hmm. um, how else? How else can we? Um, just, you know, I, I, I'm a big believer in travel and exposing yourself oh. to different kinds of people, different Leaving cultures, the house, different you foods. Mean? Leaving the house. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, spending time with people from a really different background or of a very different age. Okay. Um, so, you know, just like broadening your worldview. Yeah. But, you know, I've done, let me give, give you examples of the things that I've done in the past few years. Like I learned to play tennis again after a long time. Okay. I taught myself piano keyboard using the Flowkey app. I've learned several languages. Whoa. Um, around the same time that I was doing the tennis, I was working on like just having a happier outlook because it was a lot less tangible. Yeah. So I had to kind of compare the process to the tennis where I could see that I was getting better at the tennis. Okay. It was a bit harder to see with the happiness thing until I passed that tipping point. Mm. And I was just noticing every beautiful little thing, you know, rather than focusing on the problems. Yes. Yeah. Don't you love those days? You feel like you have more of those days now? Mm. I when feel like it's, it's a much more natural process that takes less effort yeah. than it did. You know, at some point during the pandemic, I was kind of like struggling with everything that was wrong in the world. You know? Oh yeah. And yeah. I sort of thought, 
this is just actually spiraling like quite negatively. I've yeah. got to do something about it. So because I was having the tennis lessons at the time, I thought, okay, can I do with happiness what I'm doing with tennis? Oh, wow. I love that. Mm. So when you were a practicing psychiatrist, you had written that you were fed up maybe with mosquito? Mm. No. Um, with like medicating and hospitalization and you felt like that was kind of the go-to, right? In that practice? Well, in, my, in my job, it was. I mean, my job was to diagnose mental illnesses and prescribe the appropriate medication. And so at some point that it felt for you like what there, there's another way, maybe sometimes it's necessary, but yeah. Like, how I mean, do you feel about that? So how I feel about it has changed at the time. Yeah. I would say that I felt that the focus was always on pathology mm -hmm. and that I wanted to focus on improving something that was already good and healthy. Wow. And, and that by doing that, I would actually have a bigger impact because I would be working with people who lead a team or a business and have a family and have corporate social responsibility and that just the positive impact of that would be greater. Yeah. yeah. Um, so if you think about it, for example, I mean, I was a psychiatrist, so I wouldn't have been that useful in the pandemic, but instead of being a, a doctor for individual patients in the pandemic, that's when I really ramped up what I did on social media to help people with what I could see would be the mental health consequences of this pandemic. Wow. Um, so yeah, the focus from pathology to mm. health and optimization was part of my journey. Yeah. And now, obviously this, I mentioned the psychedelics, that's an exciting area of research, but nutritional psychiatry is very interesting as well. You know, the way mm. that you eat and feed your brain and how, um, eating badly can cause mental health issues right. and how eating well can actually help with a lot of them. And it's amazing how many doctors you'll go to and express that you're depressed and their answer, their questions aren't like, what are you eating? Are you moving your body? Are you, you know, yeah, meditating? Yeah. Are you getting enough sleep? Yeah. Have mm -hmm. you heard like meds, the meds, meditation, exercise, diet, sleep? Oh, that's cool. Right? Yeah. Not to say that sometimes medicine isn't necessary, but I, mm. I think I had a really bad experience with a psychiatrist. I went, I talked for an hour, and at the end of it, he was like, I think you're bipolar, and I recommend lithium. <laughs> Probably a bad doctor, <laughs> right? Well, I haven't done a psychiatric <laughs> evaluation on you, but at the moment, you don't seem to be... No. no, I mean, I, I'm definitely eccentric. Mm. I definitely get sad sometimes and excited other times, mm. but I sleep through the night. I'm actually fine. I'm not mentally ill at all. Okay, I'm normal. I don't have a disorder. Did you see that person? But it was like, literally, I remember I was like 22 and I was telling him oh. about my, my addiction. I was telling him about how I was dangerously impulsive when I was addicted to drugs mm -hmm. and like what that looked like mm -hmm. for me. And, and then I said, now that I'm sober, okay, maybe I was like 24, 25. And I said, now that I'm sober, I like to do yoga and I meditate and I, talk, and I have a women's group and I talk to other women and I connect with other women and that's really helpful for me. Mm -hmm. And he goes, I can make you feel like you just got out of yoga 24 hours a day. He did not I say it. I swear to God, I'll never forget that. And even then I was like, part of me was like, ooh. But then part of me was like, uh, yeah. like, why are you, yeah. you know, like I can make you feel like that with this medicine. I don't know. That was a bad experience. Yeah, I think but. in the absence of a, you know, a major mental illness. Um, I also found him on Craigslist. So like, I, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> it was in a garage. I don't know. No, I'm just kidding. Okay, That's sorry. so funny. I could be slightly bipolar. I don't know. Whatever it is, I'm functioning. Yeah, exactly. You know? Yeah. <laughs> I think it, well, I think it goes back to what we were saying earlier, but if, if you can feel empowered that you managed whatever the situation was yourself, yeah. that's got to be better for you going forward and in terms of being able to meet adversity in future. Mm -hmm. Obviously, absolutely, like you said, there is a time and place for medication and some people cannot do without it. Yes, yeah. But if you can, I would love to see people, you know, <laughs> I'm literally never coming here again. <laughs> 
<laughs> is this your biggest regret? Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I, would love to see, <laughs> I would love to see people feel like proud of themselves. Yeah, I got through that. Yeah. You know, that, because that's cl exactly how I'm going to be feeling when I leave here. <laughs> <laughs> okay yeah and a glass of wine <laughs> right <laughs> right okay yes joking what are your thoughts on cbd by the way um so it works really well for some people so we have cannabinoid receptors throughout our brain and body okay and often they are triggered by inflammation so people who have whose inflammation pathways are on with cannabinoid receptors benefit a lot from CBD, we're talking non-psychoactive CBD, right? Uh-huh. Um, so I, I used to um, get these bath bombs, organic bath bombs yes. with CBD. Yes. For, for me, they don't have much of an effect. Really? Magnesium is, what, is a thing that I really need to bathe in frequently. Oh, wow. But for my family, um, the CBD bath bombs were like so rejuvenating. So it just made me think that my cannabinoid pathways are probably okay. Okay. But inflammation was like, you know, was happening on several pathways wow. for other members of my family. Because that's the one thing that I will take for anxiety mm -hmm. at the end of the day sometimes, okay. and it calms me. Yeah. But then I worry about the effects it has on my brain. Like, I don't know, actually. Well, most of the stuff that you can get now is non-psychoactive. Yeah, yeah, it's just CBD. Yeah. It's like a mint yeah. of CBD. Yeah. But, like, I don't know. I guess I just worry about it because I don't do any take any other substances or anything. Yeah. Some people actually get more anxious with it. So I think it is very personal. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So if you feel like it does calm you. It calms me. Yeah. And it's not leading to any amotivational syndrome because that's the, that's the most general first thing that tends to happen if people use products in that kind of family. Okay. And you seem very motivated yeah. to me. So <laughs> I, I'm not really worried about Okay, that. good, yeah. good, good. Great. I'll keep taking it. <laughs> okay. But wait, what were we saying? We got sidetracked. Did we? Well, we were talking about the psychiatrist. <laughs> yes, the psychiatrist. Maybe you should ask him if he thinks you should take CBD. I don't think so. He's going to be like, not strong enough. You need lithium. What did, um, you can say too personal as well if you don't want to share, but what did your brain scan show? ADHD. Oh, interesting. Yeah. He said ADHD and it was the kind with, I guess there's like a million kinds, the one with a little depression sprinkled in there. Oh, interesting. Yeah. And you don't take anything for that? No. 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 It's funny. I, it's never been bad enough. And it's always been circumstantial. Like, it's never been like, I'm just sad for no reason. It's mm. like, no, I'm pretty clear that this is why something's I'm going on. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And, and I swear, if I do the right things, like if I prioritize my sleep, mm -hmm. if I go to bed, for me, it's embarrassing. Like, I'll yesterday I was in bed at like 8 p.m. <laughs> now I sit and I read or I'll watch something which maybe isn't good but I go in so early so I can try and actually be asleep by 10 or 11. Okay you know well, it takes you that long to fall asleep. Yeah and I also just really love resting mm -hmm. and I feel like as a mom with like you know, a two and a four year old mm. and working and just, mm -hmm. there's so much that I just, that's love. your time. Yeah. Too. Yeah. Sometimes it's nine or something, but just, I don't know. I love that time of just total relaxation. And you know? do you take any, um, omega three oils? Cause that, that can be helpful for ADHD. Oh, interesting. I used to, I saw it, the mosquito, he's back. Um, <laughs> Um, I used to, and then I forgot, like I had omega threes that I would take and then I just wasn't consistent. I took AG one for a long time. Mm -hmm. I'm running out of that. I think that has omega threes. Does it? it? Should I, I should take omega threes. Um, I'm not, I'm not oh, like no. feeling things that aren't really there. Um, <laughs> for those of you listening, we're getting eaten alive <laughs> by mosquitoes now. Yeah. So when I, when I did child psychiatry and I worked a lot with, in the clinic with little boys that presented with ADD or ADHD for the first time, if the parents didn't want them to go onto medication, mm -hmm. then I did suggest mm -hmm. um, high dose omega-3 oils. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. How about um, autism? Any like vitamins you suggest for that? Well, so the latest research around that shows that the gut microbiome might be um, quite involved in, in the symptoms of that. So probiotics 
Wow. That's what the research is looking at for autism. Yeah. Wow, very interesting. Mm. Yeah, my son is on the spectrum and my ex too. And so that's definitely mm -hmm. something. So you could just, um, if, he, if he likes it, you could try introducing him to like sauerkraut and kimchi and kefir and kombucha. Whoa. I don't know if children can drink kombucha. <laughs> You're trying to get my son drunk. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, but those fermented foods. Yeah. And, and, and actually, um, am I allowed to name a brand? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Seed does a pediatric Ooh. probiotic. Yeah, Ooh. so you could get that. It's like a gummy? I'm not sure what the... They like the gummies. Yeah. You know? I don't know. Have a, have a look on their website. Okay, okay. Um, what else? What else did we miss? Did we miss anything? I think we've talked about everything. Have we? Yeah. Do you feel like that? Yeah. What are some practical things that the viewers can do to help improve their brain and quality of life? So all the basic foundational factors that we mentioned, yeah. so good sleep, good diet, um, not being sedentary and you know, doing some deep breathing, drinking enough water and you know, having some ways to manage stress. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, I would say... Not putting out on the first date. Not, yeah, not doing that. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then making a vision board and, and or doing some sort of visualization practice. Gratitude practice is huge. You mentioned walking around, you know, you live in a stunning area. So nature is very beneficial for our mental health, our health and our longevity as well. Why is that? Um, so there's a field of study called neuroaesthetics or mm -hmm. neuroarts. And it's basically about how beauty and creativity boost our brain and our Whoa. immunity. And nature is the palette that we've existed in for all time. Yeah, yeah. So, you, sh you know, it'll be different for different people, but like green trees or mountains or the ocean, mm -hmm. it gives us a sense of like awe and beauty. Yes. And that's actually very good for us. Every time. Yeah. Yeah. And actually, if you do live in a, a, a wooded area like you do, Certain trees, particularly pines and firs and cedars and cypresses, um, trigger the re they, they release something called phytoncides that trigger the release of natural killer cells in your immune system, boosting your immune system. Whoa. Very so cool. That so that nature just, walk. Just hug it? Do I have to hug it? You just walk past? Just okay. walking. Just in walk by it? Yeah. Can I look at it? You can, t you can touch okay. it if you want to. Really? Yeah. Okay. Is it like more effective if I... <laughs> Kiss it? <laughs> Not on the first date. <laughs> Not on the first date. Okay. I like that. So walking in nature. Um, right. And then learning new skills too. And having a sense of purpose that isn't just all about you. You talked about intention, how important that is. Mm. But I thought, I, can you have more than one? Mm. <sighs> okay. Yeah. What's your intention? What's your intention right now? <laughs> um, well, so I would say purpose and intention are slightly different. So mm -hmm. intention is important in that there's a big difference to the brain between practicing time-restricted eating or intermittent fasting versus just skipping meals because you were busy. Mm, yeah. So Because the brain knows whether there was intention behind it or not. Wow. And it's the same as the difference between daydreaming where you drift off when you're meant to be focusing on coming up with new comedy or mind wandering when you go for your walk and you think okay like what new ideas could I bring in today yeah those things are very different yeah purpose is kind of like working out what will you put on this planet to do that you can uniquely bring to the world and, yeah. you know and hopefully in some way shape or form help others by doing that thing yeah um so I think mine is, is definitely speaking about, you know, mental health and brain health, um, yeah. making it accessible mm. is really important to me. I see, even though I am a scientist, I see myself, my, my role is important as a translator mm -hmm. because there are a lot of people out there that will use really long, confusing scientific terms and yeah. that doesn't help people. Yeah. So my, my mission is to like really make that very simple and accessible for people. That's so cool. So you have a clear intention and a clear purpose. Yeah. I think so yeah, and you know, and and that can change from time to time. Right. Yeah. Right. Do you feel like that's behind a lot of mental illness and depression is not having a clear purpose? I wouldn't go so far as to say that it's behind mental illness and depression, but I would say that those things can certainly make it harder for you to 
focus on a sense of purpose or find a sense of purpose. Sure. So it's a real kind of vicious circle, isn't it? Yeah. 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 Also like understanding too, at least what I've found is like, I have a clear purpose and I'm doing what I love for a living, but mm -hmm. to not connect my self worth to that mm -hmm. is like so important because mm -hmm. then if something goes south mm -hmm. when I'm you know doing my work it's like it affects my mental health yeah so external validation yes. is is a very very interesting thing to think about and I've been very lucky that I've had some clues along the way that's helped me to kind of stay just ahead of that so when I did my medical school exams mm -hmm. I was so nervous on the day that the list went up because basically a list would go up with everybody's name. And if yeah. your name was on it, you, you're a doctor. And if wow. your name's not on it, you have not passed. Yeah. I was so nervous. I couldn't go up to the hospital to look at it myself. My boyfriend at the time, who was my became my first husband, yeah. he went. And he came back and he said, your name's on the list, um, which was amazing. And then he, because he was already a doctor, he said to me, just because you're a doctor now, don't forget that you're a human. Wow. It was such an amazing piece of advice. Ooh, yeah. And then later, when the source was coming out in 2019, mm -hmm. one of my friends who'd written a book the year before, who was also a coach, said it's really interesting because you go from being very focused on the other mm. and it's not about you at all mm. to suddenly people like your book, they hate your book, they love your book, they, you know, you know, they'll give you a great testimonial, they'll criticize it. Yeah. And you've got to like ground yourself and like, shield yourself from the effects that that could have on you totally so i was lucky that she kind of forewarned me and i was very thoughtful about that yeah um but yeah now with social media like everybody's basically you know scrutinized and yeah can be like commented on so it does come back to the like, internal validation and having your own back and you know self-love being unconditional right? yes and you being enough because you exist you know that to me is just so important because that the the money the fame all of that it's like i find a service mindset is really been effective mm. for me too mm. of like waking up in the morning and setting the intention of like what can i give today rather than what can i get because mm -hmm. when i'm focused on what i can get too much it's kind i'm kind of miserable yeah right yeah it's like never enough but yeah. when it's like what can i give all of a sudden it's richer and mm. more exciting and mm. Isn't it? Yeah, totally. that's That's service mindset. And that's more in your control, isn't it? So it's actually more yes. comfortable for your brain. Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. There you go. Yeah. That's why I'm doing it. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Pat. You're amazing. You are too. I'm going to listen crush. to you tonight. Girl crush. Yeah. I'm going to listen to you tonight as I drift off to sleep again. <laughs> your, her book is absolutely amazing. Get it. It's called The Source. I'm sure you can get it where? Everywhere. Literally everywhere. <laughs> Anywhere. Go to a TGI Fridays, it's there. <laughs> Anywhere, her book is available, okay? Um, <laughs> where can they find you on social media? Um, I'm most active on Instagram, Dr. Tara Swart. Oh yeah, That's a, she's got a great Instagram. I stalk her Instagram. This is getting really weird. <laughs> I'm gonna be watching her Instagram till not two in the morning. No. <laughs> What's the ideal time to go to bed? Um, well, it depends what time you wake up. <laughs> It's whatever, it's eight hours I mean, and 15 yeah, minutes. You've got young kids, so yours is probably a bit earlier than mine. Yeah, mine's yeah. 7 p.m., but like, <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. But yeah, so we're, uh, and Instagram, and then where else? Anywhere else? Yeah, I'm also on Twitter, at Tara Swart. Cool. Um, my website is taraswart.com. Well, I'm excited. Will you come back on, please? Yeah, I'd love to. She's not gonna come back on. <laughs> she's not gonna, she's just saying that. She's just saying, she's never <laughs> coming back on. <laughs> Mosquito. No. <laughs> Is it because I almost smacked you twice? Okay. Do you do you do this to everyone that you interview? Like stalk them on Instagram and like. Well, it's like called research, Tara. <laughs> I'm researching. You should know about research, Miss <laughs> Scientist. That's all I'm doing. It's nothing weird. <laughs> you know, want to get to know the person before I get to know them a little bit, yeah. right? Yeah. Because I've done it the other way where I have no idea. I'm like, who are you? <laughs> Why are you in my house? <laughs> I don't remember booking you. What do you do? Oh, nothing? You're homeless. Okay, I'm not sure why you're here. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. So it's good to, you know. Anyway, that's it. We did it. Thank you, Tara. <laughs>
Thank you so much. It was so fun. You were amazing. <laughs>